Joining me now to discuss Douglas Brinkley, CNN presidential historian. Always nice to have you with us. Um, we hear Hillary Clinton tout her tenure as Secretary of State often as one of her qualifications to be president. And yet, this scrutiny is not going away. In fact, in many ways, it's, it's only increasing in terms of the Clinton Foundation's interactions with the State Department during her tenure as Secretary of State. So, so how, Douglas, is that impacting not only her message, but her credibility at this point? Well, it isn't uh, hitting her yet in the polls. It's not damaging her, but the, uh, she, that interview with Anderson, she was in such a defensive crouch. Um, and this is the season where you want to be full of optimism and feel like you're, uh, you know, charging forward with a lot of joy and glee. Instead, uh, you feel she's just batting away all these charges. The Clinton Foundation's done incredibly noble work around the world, but it was very large. And when things get that big, sometimes you don't really know all that's going on. So I'm, I'm afraid there may be more documents from the Clinton Foundation connecting it with the State Department. We already know there'll be a WikiLeaks October surprise of some okay. kind. And she may very well win the election, but she's going to be doing so um, um, in a more defensive posture. That's why she hasn't done a lot of interviews in the last month. And, and that is also being criticized. Uh, her, 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 her lack of a willingness, I suppose, to speak with members of the press. In terms of the email controversy, though, she is getting some praise for being so candid last night with Anderson. But to your point, she's continually batting away these charges. Is it too little too late? Why can she not at this point trump these issues and move forward? Uh, she's continually dogged by them. Uh, look, if um, if there was somebody else besides Donald Trump running, he's such a, a poor candidate in so many ways. I think Hillary Clinton would be in a deep jam right now. She's been unable to get rid of this email controversy. It has plagued her 24 hours, you know, every single day. Um, so I don't have an answer for how she stops it, but it's part of it's been the drip, drip, drip. The, you know, the fact that I'm able to already tell you, Erica, there'll be an October surprise with right. WikiLeaks <laughs> and Lord knows what they're going to find, you know. It, 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 it makes it an unusual circumstance. It reminds me of Nixon in 1972 where he won big. And I'm, well, it looks like Hillary Clinton could very easily win, but he had Watergate kind of hanging over him. She might, on Inauguration Day, still be dealing with charges of impropriety, dealing with the Clinton Foundation and with the State Department email scandals. It's just and, not going away. And that is a major issue that you hear inconsistently in polling, and frankly for polling for both candidates, of course, that they both have, we say this a lot, but because it's tough to ignore, they both have the highest unfavorables. One other thing that's sort of surprising is we're now just a couple of weeks out from the first debate. We don't have a moderator. Donald Trump has weighed in. He obviously has his thoughts on who he'd like to see in that role. Um, you know, sort of refresh my memory here. Is it normal that this far out, not a long way from that first debate, we don't know who's moderating? Oh, not recently normal, but keep in mind, um, um, Erica, that these debates are not part of our Constitution. I mean, the first presidential debate our country ever held was in 1960. And then we didn't do one in 64 or 68 or 72. Now it's become right. something you must do, but um, you know I think there's just been a lot of confusion uh, on uh, you know due to NFL rules and uh, uh, what networks sure. and all of that. But they'll happen, and I think these debates <laughs> will probably serve Donald Trump better than Hillary Clinton. Well, we'll all be watching. I do want to call to your attention and to our viewers now. We're getting a live picture of this meeting that Donald Trump is having at Trump Tower. As we mentioned, he's sitting down with uh, fellows, African-American and Hispanic fellows from the RNC's Republican Leadership Initiative. Um, it's a six-week fellowship program which trains activists uh, in reach out and reaching out to Republicans and folks who are and traditionally to non-Republicans as well. Um, so. A lot of people watching to see what comes out of this meeting as Donald Trump, of course, continues his efforts to reach out to more voters, uh, to find a message that can resonate with blacks, with Latinos, with different uh, ethnic and cultural groups in the United States. We'll continue to follow that for you again. This happening live uh, right now, kicking off not too long ago as he is meeting uh, with this group.
from the RNC's Republican Leadership Initiative with a group of minority activists. I just want to get your take real quickly, too, Douglas, on that outreach that we've seen. Um, there's been a lot of criticism about the broad strokes that Donald Trump used initially in the last week or so as he was trying to reach out to more African-American voters to bring them over to his side, saying, hey, what have you got to lose? Uh, is that message, though, something that could actually prove effective for him, saying, hey, you know what, just try me? I think it's important that he's doing it. Um, now, the fact that he, he started reaching out to African Americans with an all-white uh, audience, I think, was probably a mistake. But the, the point of the matter is, he's got time now to circulate in African American communities. He's doing that right now with the video you're showing. But I think he needs to go into the cities, go into some schools, uh, really be seen in neighborhoods around the country uh, if he wants to try to, you know, peel off an extra 5% of the African American vote. He already has more African Americans in polls than uh, McCain and Romney had. So, uh, you know, he might be able to make some um, inroads in this regard. Not, not big ones, but little ones, and little ones can matter. We just saw at the table there, we saw a shot of um, Steve Bannon, uh, who's now the CEO of the campaign, of course, coming over from Breitbart Media. There was a lot of criticism with that move um, because of the history of Breitbart and uh, a number of the things that have been published over there on their websites. How does this change up in leadership impact that effort to reach out to different minority groups, especially when we're seeing someone like Steve Bannon there at the table? Well, I think that, you know, Trump's now looking at the polls, probably. You know, we remember all he used to do was talk about polls. In the last month, he stopped talking about them because he's down in all of them. Uh, however, he's got to do something about African-American and Latino voters. He's got to reassure suburban, moderate Republicans to vote for him. So he has to soften his message. And, uh, um, you know, we're, we're now starting to see that with the change of people in his staff. Uh, that they're starting to kind of humanize them a little more instead of just being uh, the bullying uh, angry man. And we just saw, too, in terms of changes, we just saw Kellyanne Conway there, uh, camera, focusing on her, his campaign manager. Douglas Sprinkley, always appreciate your insight. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Erica. Still to come.